Anytime you have a vector auto regression, it's naturally fun and tempting to calculate the impulse response function. And it turns out this one uh, tells us a lot about the dynamics and the economics of what predictability means. Um, so um, let's do that. We have this, uh, I, I rewrote the vector auto regression here. This is actually using <clears throat> real numbers, the one I'm going to show you. Uh, and the impulse response function uh, asks the question, hit it with a unit shock, turn all the shocks off, and watch the dynamics happen. So it's always a nice way to characterize what the dynamics of a vector autoregression imply. Now, we have underlying everything this return identity, uh, and the return identity reminds us that there's only really two variables here, and thus there's only really two shocks. Well, we cannot separately have a return shock with no DP and no D move, a dividend yield shock with no return and no DV. It just doesn't make sense. To have a return shock, you have to move either the dividend yield, you have to move prices, or you, have, or you move dividends. They are linked together. So we have to choose which pairs we want to move, which underlying two shocks do we want to do. I'm going to make a choice. This choice is informed by having run it every possible which way and knowing which is the prettiest answer. Now, this is all interpretation, so that it doesn't really matter which way you do it. Uh, my choice will be to have a dividend growth shock and a dividend yield shock, or which I'll also call an expected return shock. They both uh, satisfy the identity. The dividend growth shock, I'm going to move dividend growth by one, and I'm going to move the return by one. So I, the identity will be satisfied. And what that means is we're going to have a, a shock to dividend growth, no shock to dividend yield. So naturally, if dividend growth goes up and the prices go up with the dividends, you get the same return as the dividend growth shock. My second shock will be an expected return shock. Uh, dividend yield shock, that one moves dividend yield and, and return and leaves the dividend growth alone. Uh, now, because of the identity, there's a row involved here. If the dividend yield goes up one, returns have to go down by row. Uh, now, again, it's not magic pairing these two together. You, you have to pair them together some way uh, in order to satisfy the identity and, and to make any sort of common sense. One reason why these are nice is, is we found in the data that the correlation of these two shocks is about zero. It's nice to have uncorrelated shocks. You don't have to have uncorrelated shocks to plot impulse response functions, but it's kind of nice to think of these as, as two underlying shocks uncorrelated with each other, which are driving uh, events. So now our job is pretty simple. We've decided on the two shocks. We're going to hit the system first with uh, return and dividend, with, with these two shocks going up by one leaving dividend yields alone, and watch the dynamics involve. And the second thing we're going to do is we're going to hit it with a, a dividend yield shock, a minus row on the return shock, no dividend growth shock, watch the dynamics evolve, and, and we'll see what comes up. So let's look at the pretty picture. Uh, here is the pretty picture. Um, if we... Uh, so the top row is the, the dividend uh, growth shock, and the bottom row is the dividend yield shock. So, well, let's see that it makes sense. What happens when you hit this system with a dividend growth shock? Let me go back quickly. If we hit it with a dividend growth shock, if that goes up by one, then the return also goes up by one. But since the dividend yield is unchanged, nothing happens after that. So it's just going to be a one period move and then nothing happens. And you see that exactly. The return and dividend growth, they lie on top of each other. They're just a one period move and then nothing happens. Adding them up is kind of interesting. That This is the cumulative response. So what that tells us is when dividend growth, dividend growth being shocked for a period means the level of dividends goes up and stays up. So this I like to call a cash flow shock. We got news that current and all expected future cash flows will go up. There's no news to expected returns. So what happens in this situation? Well, if you learn that all div the dividends are risen and dividends are always going to be higher, then prices go up. Prices will always stay higher. The price-dividend ratio doesn't change. Uh, and after this one lucky, unexpected return, expected returns are, aren't affected at all. Now, the more interesting one is the dividend yield shock. Let's see how that, this produces all these interesting dynamics. Let's see why that makes some sense in the, uh, in the numbers. What happens when we shock up the dividend yield shock? That one goes up by one. Now, in the first period, the epsilon r had to go down by row, right? They were related. So the dividend yield's going to go up. It's going to really hit re the first period returns. But what happens after that? What happens uh, in the second and third period? Well, the dividend yield itself has gone up. So now a higher dividend yield. As the dividend yield slowly comes back, expected returns 
are going to slowly come back as well. Uh, basically, nothing's going to happen to dividend growth since that coefficient is all about exactly zero. And now, now let's look. That's what we expect to see. Let's go see that the graph does exactly what I just said we would expect. What happens? The dividend yield shock goes up one. So we get a sudden, I don't have room for minus 0.96. Minus 0.96 is way down below there. A big negative shock to returns. And then the expected return is higher period after period. So there's slow decline in expected returns. Nothing much happens to dividends. Over here, I accumulated them up. Uh, this is the, the accumulated return and the, and the accumulated price. You can see dividends basically go nowhere. Price falls by minus 0.96. And then the prices slowly recover through this period of, of higher expected returns. So you can see how it's, it's producing, uh, mechanically what it's producing. Now let's think about uh, what that means uh, intuitively. This I would call an expected return shock with no change to expected cash flows. What happens if there's no news about cash flows but discount rates go up? People get scared. Well, prices fall, bing, you get a big negative return this period, but then the expected return is higher. People have to earn a higher return uh, in order to compensate them for, for risk. And so the prices uh, return, come back slowly uh, in response to expected return shock. So these have a natural economic interpretation. It's very beautiful to see. We can decompose in this VAR movements in prices due to cash flow shocks with no expected return implication, expected return shocks with no cash flow implications. Here, there's a component of stocks that are acting just like bonds. This shouldn't be mysterious. This was what bonds do. If interest rates go up, bond prices tank, and then bond prices slowly recover that because the yield is higher. So there's a component of stocks that's acting like bonds. But of course, actual movements in stocks are, are mixed 50-50. Both of these events are happening at, at every day. What's lovely is by watching dividends, we can find a purely transitory component of stock prices. We started with stock prices are a random walk, and in response to dividend growth shocks, yeah, they act like random walks. But here is a component of prices which is purely transitory. Price goes down, and it will melt entirely away in time. So there is a purely transitory component of prices. How do you see it? If a price went up, is that this one or that one? You got to watch the dividends. If the price went up and the dividends stayed where they are, you know it'll melt away. If the price went up and dividends went up together, uh, they're both going to stay up together forever. Finally, uh, how do we interpret these impulse response functions? It's, it's easy to jump to cause and effect, that the shock caused the response. In finance, we think of these things exactly the opposite. The way we think of these is this is the news. What we woke up this morning and said, wow, expected returns need to be higher. Uh, some, some, something dangerous has broken out in the world. I'm going to try to sell my stocks. In doing so, I the prices jump down. So the causality is the higher expected returns is what causes the price to go down in the first place. Similarly here, the higher expectations of future dividend growth is what causes the price to go up in the first place. The, the, the natural interpretation in a present value context is causality is exactly the opposite, not that the shock sets off these dynamics. It's sort of like a, a weather forecaster. The, the weather forecaster, if he says it's going to rain in the weekend, then it's likely that you will see rain in the weekend. Uh, but unfortunately, that doesn't mean that telling him to shut up will give you a sunny day. Causality runs from the rain to the weather forecaster uh, the same way causality runs from, from future dividends and future returns uh, to prices today.